I'm Charlie Garcia, and welcome back to episode 5 of Liquid Rocket Engines. Today, we'll be discussing the main propellant valve, last week we worked on the pressurization system. So next, we need to worry about the valve that is going to hold the pressurized propellant inside the tanks until it's time for it to be used by the engine. After we do that, we'll talk about how we're going to modify commercial valves to meet these requirements. And finally, we're going to build one. First, let's talk about valve requirements. We need this valve to have a full diameter port. That is, the perforation in the ball should be the same diameter as the piping. This will help minimize the pressure drop across the valve. Because this valve won't be opening to start the engine, it doesn't need to actuate that quickly. So I can get away with making this valve a little cheaper by using electric actuation instead of pneumatic actuation. This means I need a large enough electric actuator and a good enough gear ratio in order to develop enough torque to open and close this valve at cryogenic temperatures. Speaking of which, this valve needs to be suitable for cryogenic applications. Because of the massive cost difference between cryogenic and normal valves, my plan is to purchase a normal valve and modify it for cryogenic applications. If this fails miserably, I can always purchase cryogenic ones, but I'd really rather not. Alright, step one, disassemble and modify the commercial valves. When I get the commercial off-the-shelf or COTS valve in, it will have been designed for some, presumably, non-rocket purpose. The very first thing we have to do to this COTS valve is to open it up and take a peek inside. Once I have it all apart, I can modify the ball by poking a hole in it right here. This vents the ball, so when it's closed, it doesn't trap a volume of cryogenic fluid inside of it. Liquid oxygen expands about 800 times when it boils off, so if I didn't vent this ball, it would pop the valve like a balloon. Thankfully, that's the only mechanical modification I need to make. So now I need to strip down any grease or lubricant that was installed on the valve by the manufacturer, because these most likely aren't oxidizer safe, and certainly aren't rated for cryogenic temperatures. To do this, I'm going to place the valve components inside of an industrial washing machine. This will also help take care of any contaminants on the valve. Any organic contaminants inside the valve could be ignited on contact with the liquid oxygen. So to prevent that, they need to be incredibly clean. An isopropyl alcohol bath in an ultrasonic cleaner would be a better way to do this, but I'm not set up for a class 1 oxygen clean, so I'll just have to make do with what I've got. After I've washed the valve, I'll remove and discard all the OEM seals. These seals are made from various elastomeric compounds, but I need to be using special elastomers that are compatible with liquid oxygen. So I'll replace all of these seals with fluoropolymer o-rings. The original grease I removed earlier will be replaced with Krytox. Krytox is an oxidizer-safe lubricant and grease that costs about $30,000 a bucket. So you kind of have some insight into why rocket projects get so expensive so quickly. Now that we've repacked the valve, I can reassemble everything to get a rocket-ready manual ball valve. I'll need to reperform this same process for all of the fill, drain, isolation, bleed, and vent valves on the oxidizer side. Step 2. Design the valve actuator. Okay, so there's a few ways to do this. The brute force method involves welding a motor shaft onto the valve stem and allowing that to turn the valve directly. If you were feeling really fancy, you could put a compliant shaft actuator in line between the motor and the valve stem in order to take up any shaft misalignment between the two. This method will certainly let you turn the valve fast enough, but developing enough torque to turn the valve this way would be very challenging, so we're going to look for other methods. You could put a large gear on the valve stem, which is what many commercial valve actuators do, but I'd rather not go down this route. If I start working with the gear trait, I'm going to add a lot of complexity in the form of bearings and shafts and lots of other distinct parts to worry about. A much simpler solution is to use a threaded rod, a split nut, and a bushing. With this simpler design, you'll still get great torque. But, as an added benefit, the motor will be insulated from the cryogenic temperatures by the long threaded steel rod. If you hadn't guessed, this is how I'm planning on building my main propellant actuator. And step three, delete everything. So I tried guys, and this design just doesn't work. Not, not even a little bit. Um, it was too complicated, it had uh, too many parts, it was too heavy, it was too expensive, it was too large, it was just not working on so many fronts. I worked on it over two or three days, and I tried several different iterations using different combinations of motors and gears and valves, uh, but there's only so many of those that fit in my budget and in my other constraints, so really I just kind of had to step back away and I deleted everything, and I slept on it for a night, and I woke up, and the first thing I started with was instead of a CAD file, I started with a drawing. And uh, I made and I made a couple of drawings, uh, and the one that I ended up using was, was this one right here. Uh, so this was just an idea I had for using uh, still a, a ball screw, but now in a, a parallel direction to the motor. And this really compactified the valve actuator and also helped me mount everything securely, uh, which was a big problem I was having developing enough stiffness in the other design. This is an excellent interlude to talk about failure. Aerospace has a ton of high-stakes testing and operations that can go horribly wrong. And when a rocket blows up, it's easy to understand that as a failure. Some of these failures also happen in qualification and acceptance testing. 
Failures during QTP or ATP can still be expensive, but even more importantly perchance, they set the schedule back by a significant amount. It might be tempting to call abandoning a design concept as a failure. In fact, I think most non-engineers would imagine the process of catting a part as the design phase of creating a part. But that'd be inaccurate. The design phase mostly happens long before you ever create a single sketch or extrude a single body. The design phase of a part is when you understand the critical requirements and functionality of a part, and then work to implement a design that conceptually can complete all of those requirements. When you cat a part, you're simply realizing those features in detail. When you abandon a concept in a design, you're helping to refine your understanding of what those requirements need to do, and you might even add some when you realize that maybe this design did meet all of your previous requirements, but it failed for some other reason you hadn't considered yet. Abandoning a design early in the design process is actually really beneficial. Like I said, if you have a failure later in the testing process, you've already sunk a ton of time and resources into that design. So as soon as you know a design is failing, you need to leave it be. Even if I could have spent several more hours working on this design and getting it to a potentially viable state, it would be a less robust design than the new design that I have. Less robust designs are more prone to failures later in the testing process, or even on the test stand itself, uh, which is dangerous for all the obvious reasons that having a leaky main propellant valve is dangerous. This all kind of comes down to the sunk cost fallacy, and making sure that you recognize and avoid the sunk cost trap is a critical skill for engineers to have. Step 4. Trying again. After my first valve design attempt, I knew a couple more things. First, I wanted the motor to mount in line with the valve to keep the form factor acceptable. Second, I wanted the motor to be static, that is, not moving. In my initial design, the motor pivoted with the ball stem, and this made the whole assembly larger and more complicated. And finally, I knew that I needed more significant structural supports to help hold the motor in place. The previous valve actuator design wasn't very stiff, and this made it prone to potential issues with binding or getting uh, jammed. And so for this new design, I wanted very stiff supports so that the motor would be well supported and not be prone to these issues. Knowing what I know on the second go-around, I started by catting some really thick steel plates. I made these plates steel because they're strong and also slightly more thermally insulative than aluminum, and I also wanted to put big threads into them. So while I could have used G10 here for its insulating properties, I don't really enjoy tapping threads into fiberglass, so I decided to go with steel. After designing the end plates, I went ahead and added a motor mounting point underneath the valve here. These two plates will support the motor on both ends and help make the valve a strong, stiff actuator. After designing the mortar support brackets, I added some pockets in the steel plates to support bearings. These bearings will have a lead screw inside of them that will deliver the rotational motion of the motor and help turn it into linear motion of an actuator. To transfer the torque from the motor into the lead screw, I added a gearing system. The lead screw itself has a 20 to 1 gearing ratio, which transfers the power just a little slowly for my taste. So then I added a reduction gearing here so that we develop a 1 tenth mechanical advantage across the lead screw. These gears will be water jet from steel and then hardened. I don't have a gear hopping setup, so this is going to have to do, even though it's not a particularly good practice. If the surface roughness from this process is too high, I can just pick up these gears from a supplier for about $20. In order to complete my linear actuator, I need to add something to constrain the nut riding on the lead screw to prevent it from just spinning in place. I could have done this with either a linear rail or a hardened steel rod, but I decided to go with the rod. I don't need the positional accuracy granted by a rail, and the rod is cheaper and easier to implement. So I added two more holes, and one hole for a grub screw to trap the rod in place. Alright, we're almost done here, we just need to transfer this linear motion from this uh, threaded rod right here up into the valve stem, so we're going to do that by adding a traveler that connects to a bushing on the hardened rod, as well as to the nut on the lead screw and then we'll add a rod that sticks up from that and captures into a plate that will be mounted onto the valve stem. Alright, we're almost done here. We just need to convert the linear motion of the traveler into a rotational motion at the valve stem. So I'll create a new valve stem handle that has a slot to capture the traveler. As the traveler moves back and forth on the lead screw, it'll rotate this and rotate the valve stem. Now I'm going to enclose the valve in a case. This case will be purged with dry nitrogen gas to prevent the formation of ice or frost that could jam the valve in an inconvenient position. Nitrogen has a condensation temperature below that of the boiling point of liquid oxygen, so this will also prevent the formation of nitrogen rain inside of the valve case. The lead screw and traveler will be lubricated with a cryogenically safe lubricant, and then everything will be closed off. It's important to use low temperature lubricants, because some lubricants at normal temperatures become glues at cryogenic temperatures. This makes the valve mechanically complete, but there's a few more things to think about. Right now it'd be difficult to control this valve, since I have no feedback on the position of the valve handle. If I wanted to use this as a trim valve, I'd need full position feedback during the entire range of travel of the valve stem. 
I could obtain full state data by adding an encoder onto the lead screw shaft, or by adding a potentiometer onto the valve stem. Adding a potentiometer could potentially be a bad idea because the resistance of the potentiometer changes as a function of temperature, and this valve will experience large temperature swings. The encoder would also work well, but it still needs an absolute truth of reference in order for it to count steps from that position, so I need to add another sensor, probably a micro switch, to tell me when the valve has reached the end of its travel. Since I don't need to use this valve as a trim valve, I'm just going to add the micro switch itself so that I know when the valve is fully closed. In order to open the valve, I'll just run the valve in the other direction for a certain number of seconds and then stop it. To close the valve, I'll run the motor until the traveler hits the end switch. This will let me know to shut everything down and that the valve is fully closed. Now I was going to build one of these valves to test it for this week's video, but I can't. My valves don't get here till Monday, and by then I'm going to be flying out for a couple of job interviews, helping a friend work on some titanium motor case hardware, and then I'll be jaunting to a couple of national parks before coming back to Boston. Now, despite writing the script on uh, last Wednesday, it's Monday now when I'm filming this and my valves are in fact here. But I don't have time to film that segment for this week, so... Sorry for the delay guys, the testing footage is going to have to wait. I'm finishing this video up as I get ready to fly out to Colorado. I'm not a vlog or a travel channel, but if I see any cool rocket stuff while I'm on my trip that I'm allowed to film, I'll definitely let you guys know next week. I also recently attended a high-powered rocket launch where I tested out a new camera mount for a staging demo that I'm working on later this month. The camera faces downwards to collect dynamics data as the two stages separate, and I wanted to test the camera's field of view before I put it on the actual staging flight. I know this isn't my usual content, but hopefully it's interesting enough to be worth the video, since I won't have time to film anything else this week. That's it for this episode. I'll see you two weeks from now on Liquid Rocket Engines. Until then, good luck and Godspeed. Hey, it's an end screen again. By watching this end screen, you're increasing my average view duration. This helps the YouTube algorithm know that I have content that it should recommend to other people. If you'd like to subvert the role of bots in modern society, you can take the initiative and share this video on your own. Subscribing, liking, or commenting also helps to trick the bots into thinking that this actually might be an interesting video. As always, up on the screen off to my right, there are image cards that will let you watch this series from the beginning through the playlist or watch the previous episode. Thanks for watching, folks. Charlie out.